Then I think the next uh, point will be a panel discussion. We are running a little bit over time, so Mahesh, you will make it up, I, I'm sure. <laughs> All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. This is coffee time, right? <laughs> well, we'll try to make this very active and very engaging. So it's going to be pure discussion uh, with just a brief introduction. My name is Mahesh Das. I am a Dean of School of Architecture and Design at the University of Kansas. And uh, just uh, briefly, I have served uh, for a couple of times as president of Acadia, Association for Computer Design and Architecture. And I also serve on the editorial board for IJAC, the International Journal of Architectural Computing. Um, the rest of the bios are in the material, so I won't go any further. And uh, I'm going to hand it to my partner here, Andrew. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, okay. This thing works. Okay. Hi. I'm I'm Andrew Witt. Um, I am uh, an assistant professor at the at Temple University's Tyler School of Art, um, and my research is in robotics and uh, and composite materials. Uh, and over the past. Uh, Several years, Mahesh and I have had the pleasure to work with many of the members of the community uh, to put together a project which um, we're going to briefly outline here at the beginning. Um, uh, it's a book on, on robotics called Towards a Robotic Architecture. Um, and we're going to, for the panel session, we're going to have several of the, of the authors uh, come up here and hopefully have a very lively di uh, dialogue. Um, but I think uh, what we were trying to do with this project was basically begin to m put everything that's happened over the past 15 years together into that's one good. sort of comprehensive project. Um, and basically open, uh, create easy access for everyone to... Uh, <laughs> 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 it starts. <laughs> uh, basically, give everyone easy access beyond journals uh, that we all have access to through our universities. Um, so anyway, so we are, we're actually passing around a couple books for you guys to mess around with while we're going uh, through here. Uh, this is just, I'm, just gonna, I'm gonna screw everything up in a second because I have to switch out of this. <laughs> so, but basically this is just like a little, sneak peek of what's, what's in the book going around, and here comes the disaster um, when I go to my PDF. Oh, sorry, let me, uh, we switched the order. <laughs> so I'm just gonna skip to the, where we are. But anyway, so uh, basically the, the book is broken up into, uh, into several sections. One looks at the framing, so Apple L. So, so it looks at the framing, so what are robotic architectures? Uh, we look at how uh, production has basically changed um, how architecture is made. We look at how the tectonic language of, of architecture is basically changed as well, um, and lots of other things. And you can see here, um, we have 40 plus contributors uh, making up these, these four sections. Um, and so many of them are here in the audience today. Um, the first section, I'll hand it off to Mahesh. Uh, it's a framing section. Yeah. Well, thank you, and I just wanted to mention that a couple of books are floating around, so you're welcome to browse as uh, we talk. Uh, I think uh, first the purpose of the book is, as we have seen from a variety of conferences, that there's a lot happening in the field, right? This is a very exciting time, and uh, it is often difficult to get a perspective on all that is happening and be able to understand it, frame it, step back and reflect. And so that's what we have tried to do in this uh, particular book. So we talk about uh, really robotics, what, is, what are robotics and what are the kinds types of robotics that uh, uh, are out there and what are being engaged. But we also go into the human existential and the philosophical notions of these transformations. So these phenomena that are happening, right? This is phenomenal. This is pervasive, this is transformational. So uh, we talk about how to frame uh, robotics. And uh, one of the things we do is um, really to look at ways of framing 
robotics in architecture. How do we wrap our minds around it? And so one of the things, for instance, we have heard this today already about interaction, right? Interaction is very important. And how do we understand interaction, study interaction of various kinds with robots? Uh, so human, robot, environment interactions. And uh, be able to uh, frame research in that way. Second is process, and we've talked about this today as well. For instance, how do you design uh, with robots, and how do you fabricate, construct, and then finally, how do you actually operate with robots, uh, robotics integrated into architecture? And that is why we call this towards a robotic architecture, uh, notwithstanding a wink to Le Corbusier's towards a new architecture. <laughs> and uh, the third one is uh, about how, what is robotic architecture? How do we understand that, and how do we wrap our minds around it? And that is about not, you can have components of the building, you may have systems that are robotic, uh, you may have structures uh, that are robotic, and the space itself can become robotic. And these are all open to uh, exploration and research, experimentation and all that. And we do see, in framing it this way, that there are a lot of gaps in the field and opportunities, therefore, for us to explore uh, and the trajectories uh, that we can set in a variety of uh, organizations. We are very fortunate to have had a great set of um, uh, uh, contributors. And uh, before we go into that, I just wanted to hand it off to Andrew to talk about robotic production part of this particular field. So and I think a lot of us are involved, uh, obviously, in production. And so this is one big part of the book, looking at not only how ro robotics fit into production, but also beginning to frame some of the history of, the, uh, of robotic production in architecture. So um, within, <clears throat> within this chapter, we set up a series of, like, for instance, you see the, the, affordance, the affordances of robotic production. Like, what do we get by integrating uh, robotics into, into, the, into the production process? Um, and beyond that, like, where is this going to go in the future? Um, but production in uh, robo uh, industrial robotics in architecture is only a very small part of what the potential of robots in architecture could be. I think we've seen that in some of, in some of the workshops and also papers and award winners, that we, uh, we are dabbling with uh, industrial robots, but we're also pushing beyond that into, as Mahesh mentioned in the last framework, uh, into robotic architectures or um, sort of... Uh, uh, non-industrial types of, of autonomous robots. And this is not working, so. Um, so as I mentioned before, the first chapter is, is can, or the second chapter is robotectonics. It looks at more of uh, built projects and how they're beginning to reshape the tectonic form of architecture uh, through material, um, form, um, and so on. Uh, the, don't worry, the, the following, uh, the next chapter after that, is robotic architecture, and it begins to look at the next scale up, um, and also how architecture itself is beginning to change based on the inter introduction of, of robotic systems into, um, into the built environment. Um, and then the last, the last section of the book, we dedicate to robotic futures, looking at how we, completely, how we can move beyond uh, the industrial robots and into uh, robotic environments, uh, um, like a, a new typologies of production robots and, and just kind of speculating uh, on how uh, our robots will reshape our world, but also worlds beyond. So Mars is always in, in, in dialogues right now, but like what happens here and beyond and how does what happened beyond such as in Mars re-affect what's happening here on Earth? Um, well, well, with that, I uh, wanted to actually frame the uh, topics that we will talk about. Uh, and these themes have really emerged from the content of the book. And uh, as we invite the panelists, we jump into the discussion about these various themes and shifts of paradigm. Uh, we call these paradigm shifts because for about 20 years or longer, we were in digital fabrication paradigm. And uh, it was defined by certain things, certain affordances, uh, certain practices, certain approaches, and knowledge, and maybe times, for that matter. But now, we have moved into a distinctively different time, and different language is needed to be able to describe these phenomena and these practices. 
And that is what we'll talk about. So this shift, I mean, there was a lot of talk about master uh, builder, you know, in the last 20, 25 years, if you will. But that has now given way to collaborators. And uh, from file to factory paradigms to real-time making that we have been embracing, then the ability for, uh, if you will, environments and uh, things to make themselves or reproduce in some capacity and make uh, an autopoiesis, if you will, uh, is another shift that we have seen or been seeing. And then moving from mass customization to deutero customization, which means to be able to customize, uh, to customize. And that is a layer, uh, and the, for example, the end effectors, uh, you can throw whatever kinds of things. So the actual design of the tools, as we have seen in the case of uh, uh, species of uh, robots and all of that, that adds a layer that we have not had to deal with before in digital fabrication. You get a CNC mill, you get a 3D printer, you get a laser cutter, whatever, you do whatever. But now you actually need to think about tool making and crafting those technologies. Um, and uh, also we talk about uh, the importance of interdisciplinarity or going beyond the disciplines, transdisciplinarity. We have heard a lot about that uh, these past two days. So with that, uh, I would like to uh, uh, first say that uh, uh, thank, uh, thanks to all the contributors for the book, uh, to the book, about 42 of them, and many of them are in the audience. And uh, we would like to invite... Uh, 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 if, uh, the panelists now, uh, and uh, uh, yep. Okay. First, uh, we'd like to invite uh, uh, Sigrid. Uh, mm -hmm. Sigrid needs no introduction, right? <laughs> but I am going to just add a couple of things on a personal note that uh, the kind of leadership that Sigrid and Johannes have been providing to be able to build a network uh, that's uh, global and uh, to be able to make things happen uh, to, because knowledge does live in the networks and uh, opportunities like this become platforms. So platform builder, uh, and that's what she has been able to do brilliantly and uh, their chapter in the book talks about those is issues and aspects. So Sigrid, please come on over and take a seat. Uh, next I would like to invite uh, Kendra Byrne. Uh, Kendra uh, has a very, uh, an amazingly transdisciplinary background, and that is what uh, really attracted us to her. How many of you have seen the movie Gravity? Okay, there we go. And uh, if you have seen it, you have seen her work. Uh, uh, and she was part of a, a great team and a great company at the time, Bought and Dolly, uh, that was purchased uh, by Google, and uh, then she has been transitioning into uh, an exciting new areas where uh, really uh, getting into creating software tools to enable robotics and, and such and uh, in ways that are beyond the discipline of architecture. It is truly interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary. So Kendra, please welcome and join us. Uh, next, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, one of the pioneers of uh, uh, architectural robotics, uh, Matthias, Matthias Kohler, and uh, he needs no introduction either here particularly. Uh, but let me just uh, add a few words uh, of, uh, on a personal note that uh, clearly uh, their uh, ability to be able to create the, uh, the kind of a field, if you will, field within a field, but then it is actually not within a field, it is across the fields. And to be able to build a platform to enable people uh, to build the networks, build the knowledge, uh, and that has been phenomenal and transformational. And uh, along, uh, uh, along with uh, Fabio, uh, they have been uh, uh, fantastic and they have written their chapter really in the book uh, reflects on their journey. And that is also what points to the fact that we are in a transition between one paradigm and another. And so that's, I think, what they have reflected and talked about in the book, in their chapter. So, Fabio, thank you for, um, I'm sorry, Matthias, thank you for joining. And Fabio, thank you for being right there. They're right across each other. <laughs> Just, I also want to thank Hannes for dealing with my harassment over the period of that. So don't want to forget you in that chapter. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you for adding that. Uh, and uh, next, I'd like to invite uh, Akim, Akim Mingus. Uh, is uh, another uh, pioneer, if you will, uh, in his own right, and uh, being able to build things uh, across many institutions, many continents, 
And uh, we are all familiar with uh, the work that he and his institute have been doing. And, uh, and again, as an educator, as a practitioner, uh, we have been, we've talked about uh, where things are headed next and some very exciting things. I hope we'll get to talk about them pretty soon. Uh, so uh, I can thank you for joining us uh, today. And uh, uh, I'd also like to invite uh, the la uh, one more panelist, uh, Sina Mostafavi. And Sina has, uh, uh, he uh, is a founder of uh, a, uh, a firm called Setup Architecture, and he is currently at uh, TU Delft uh, at the Hyperbody Group, and he has been heading the robotics uh, uh, area of the Hyperbody Group. And, uh, and so his, his work uh, has been really looking into a variety of ways of uh, producing uh, you know, and, and notions of differentiation and a variety of things, as you see up on the screen, that uh, we get into uh, those aspects. So I think uh, we have uh, great uh, and broad perspectives on uh, a variety of things. We'd like to use this as a, a purely discussion uh, part of it. So we're going to get started, but we would like us all to really jump in and have opportunities to have Q&A as well. So with that uh, said, uh, we'd like to maybe kick off with, uh, you, you have seen the frameworks, and we will go back and forth to that. And uh, we will also go into those themes. So first of all, panelists, uh, do you think really, are we looking at a paradigm shift? Or is it just something we are making up? <laughs> Do you feel the same way? Do you see things? What do you see? Is, do you see a shift, a transition? Or, I mean, is it just, what do you feel? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll be on the spot for a second. Um, do I think it's a paradigm shift? I think anything that happens over a period of time results in a paradigm shift. I think we've been seeing a, a transition in new types of tools and new technologies. We've all become much more aware of how to use them and what we can do. So I think that the um, sort of shared knowledge and shared skills that we're developing around them, I think, is, is, is a paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I fully agree. I think we're in the midst of a quite a paradigm shift, and particularly from the perspective of architecture, but I think it trickles down to many fields, actually. Uh, I think it's really a shift. I mean, I mentioned it briefly this morning. I think in, in, in I call it, let's say, what makes sense in architecture and the kind of, let's say, attitudes and ethics of architecture, which slowly starts transforming. On the one hand side, integrating new demands. We've heard now about overpopulation and, and resource scarcity, etc. But on the other hand, what I really see uh, kind of happening is that people really start designing processes. They start designing with processes. They have different sensibilities. They're not interested anymore uh, in just a sketch, which then becomes materialized. It's just not interesting. It's not relevant to architecture anymore. Mm -hmm. And this is a paradigm shift to the design of architecture. It's very fundamental. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the, I think we are now just in the post-digitalization uh, era already a little bit. Because at the beginning, we tried to, to adapt all the technologies. Like, first it was the computer. Now it's the robots. We just tried to make them run as we want them to run, but actually everything is just a tool. So now we, we, we have to think about what can we do with the tool? How, how, does, how does it really change the way we think as architects, the way processes should be uh, developed, the way how we are going to build? So for me, the, the biggest curiosity at the moment is how can we change construction completely? and just think it backwards, yeah? So what do we need on the building side? And then, yeah, how does this for, sort of engage our design thinking and also the view we as architects want to work in the future? I think we all agree that's a paradigm <laughs> shift. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here, I guess. But uh, um, I think uh, what is, I think, important is that uh, 
I think we need to innovate across various levels. So I think it's, um, it's not just about construction automation, it's not just about, let's say, the design side, but I think it, the, the really critical aspect is how we look at these things together and how we reach a level where we can have a kind of feedback-informed innovation all these levels at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that will be the game changer. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of opportunities to sort of uh, um, digitalize in the various separate areas, but I think once we manage to get to that, um, that will obviously change uh, everything and probably uh, also be quite uncomfortable to some of us. Yeah. Um, uh, some of the institutions that we built, some of the uh, sort of all the kind of frameworks that we had to set in place for our previous way of doing yeah. things in architecture. I think that also needs to be said. It's not a sort of easy ride. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, uh, what I think now accelerates that is that there's an urgency. I mean, I think I really appreciate it to see all these um, things being pointed out that we can basically not keep going as we are doing it now. Yeah. So every effort to think out of the box, find alternative solutions is actually worth it because simply if we just continue, we'll not actually um, be able to address these really mm -hmm. huge problems. Yeah. And I think that's uh, a level of awareness that um, is good while also, of course, sizing the opportunities that come with it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what do you, I mean, I think at Hyperbody, there has been a lot of work done before in interactive environments and uh, so on. And there is a shift that, so there is something you have seen. I think, I think in uh, academia, for sure, we are living in a future. Uh, so we are living in a paradigm shift in academic environment, but the question is actually how we can push this into the industry. So I think uh, for sure we are living in a par paradigm shift while we are working in academic environment. I want to, for instance, re refer to one of the answers in the last session uh, mm -hmm. that Dagmar was uh, yeah. sharing, one of the presenters answered uh, to that question that what would you do if you want to do something with a robot? And that, the simple answer was, I want to do something different. And uh, so because of that, I think for sure in academic environment, we live uh, in future, but uh, I think the, the challenging yeah. the question is, how we can uh, push this into the industry and real applications. Yeah, and uh, sh to shift gears, uh, we've talked, and I think in the session, Dagmar and others were pointing out something profound, which is uh, the interaction with the robots, and uh, not just industrial robots, but any type of robots in the environments we live in is a very important part. And that when we talk about a paradigm shift, we're talking about changing our worldviews, and our own, uh, the way we look at ourselves and we define ourselves. So Rodney Brooks famously said, I'm a robot. Rodney Brooks said, I'm a robot, right? He said, I'm a biological robot. And, uh, and that is a way we are actually defining ourselves by a robot. Uh, and we've defined the world as a clock, as a computer. We have said, my brain is like... Uh, and you know, a computer, a processor. We defined ourselves in a variety of ways using uh, pervasive dominant paradigms and technologies. And uh, robotics is now entering that realm where it's actually uh, helping us define ourselves. So it's not just robots are the other, but that uh, they are actually us. <laughs> and that's a point that uh, we have seen emerge in the book as well. Uh, so the point there is, when we talk about how do you see robots uh, of various kinds as partners, I've heard the term partners, partnership. How do you see that? The interaction with what is the status of robots and robotics in the human environment, particularly as you do your uh, explorations and such? <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm, I'm not sure if I like the, the partner model so well. I mean, it's, let's say robots are clearly quite distinct from us and clear, clearly also, I mean, the boundaries are blurring and, and uh, in the sense that uh, there is an amalgamation of all kind of techniques, all kind of 
of knowledges, uh, of data flows, etc., and communications, which of course humans play, let's say, the distinctive role in, and technologies is is part of the human culture, let's put it that way. You know, humans invent these technologies, the humans drive these technologies, the humans hate these technologies, all kind of emotions uh, triggered with that. And therefore, um, it's just part of human culture, this technological yeah. part. In that sense, the partnership puts it on this kind of equal eye level. I think it's, it's, it's the wrong question for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I Bot and Dolly, I think we saw robots as creative partners in that they let us tell stories in ways that we couldn't otherwise have, have told them. Um, there wasn't anything new about the hardware that we were using to, to do this. It was all in the way that we thought about interacting with them and interfacing with them. And so instead of, um, instead of thinking of them as being these machines that would do the same thing over and over, we tried to create a way of working with them that was very iterative and expressive and allowed us to feel very kind of free in our ability to, to communicate with them. Mm -hmm. um, well, actually, I, I start unliking the term robot. Uh, because for me, I think what we have to think about is how can we develop assistive devices and so far as we use robots, we use them as dynamic intelligent assistants to assist us in doing what we as humans can't do. Yeah? So the question is, what is a robot? Or do we have assistant or assistive technology that we should further engage in or develop as architects? Because we just want to... Um, more or less get our body to do other things or our brain to do more things mm -hmm. due with technology that we can't do. So we want to actually enable our tools to be more intelligent, to, to um, give us more feedback on what we are doing. Um, like a lot of simulation is important, but also when you look at the construction site, I mean, our body is not there to really lift he heavy loads. So we have to think about, is our building machinery really intelligent enough to do what we want to do and how we want to build? Mm -hmm. So I just think, let's get rid of the term robot, or we have to redefine the term mm -hmm. robot, what it can be for architects. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, let me ask, uh, the next big thing that we all talk about uh, is what is on our minds, right? What do you see as on the horizon for you, the next challenge, and say, this is what excites me and uh, inspires me, and that's where I want to go. Akin, would you like to start us on that? Um, yeah, I think the, what I find fascinating is that we um, sort of are very interested, let's say, in process innovation. Yeah. I think we see also um, quite a bit of method innovation increasingly in this kind of uh, realms. What we don't see that much is how you actually innovate on the level that is closest to us, which are the building systems. Mm. So I think a lot of the, the, the way we actually employ the technology right now is that we get to the core of what digital technologies can do, but we still employ them for pre-digital building systems and sort of mm -hmm. yeah. uh, constructional systems. So I think one of the really exciting moments, mm -hmm. which will sort of consolidate us, I would hope, as um, domain experts, as was nicely mentioned this morning, is uh, when we get to the point where we can say, OK, here is a building system that is genuinely digital. Mm -hmm. um, because that's, I think, the Im imagination and the vision that we can bring into the game. Mm -hmm. I think we are not yet capable of developing that vision, but I think that will be extremely exciting once we get there. But I think that's the facet that, that is really, really important. I think we will not, I think um, if we just look at construction automation, if we look at the building site now and the materials that are there and the process that are there, I think that they will have to be radically reinvented, yeah. not just the processes, but actually actual systems yeah. will have to be radically reinvented to sort of be aligned with 
the, the genuine sort of potential of digital technologies. And um, the nice thing is that that falls more or less directly into our domain. Yeah, well said. Yeah, good point. Anyone else wants to respond to? What, what are the big things that you're looking at? What's on the horizon? What's next? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you are on the spot. <laughs> uh, something that I've been noticing is that with um, more and more robotics in our lives um, and in different aspects, we're starting to collect these huge amounts of, of, of data about everything. I think yeah. You see this with self-driving cars is a very clear example. I think there were some of the presentations today and yesterday that started scratching at this. When you suddenly start to instrument and collect all of the data at every step of a process, start looking at the, the quality of what was put out, looking at um, comparing back with uh, what the actual intent was, I think there's huge opportunities for things like machine learning to start to play a pretty big role in how we design, how we optimize, how we build, how we mm. plan. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we are most of the times interested in platforms, so we just look into hardware platforms, software platforms, crossbreed more or less both sides, because obviously data can't just jump on the building side or in the, pro uh, like in, in the product or project. So there is, I think, a huge gap that uh, still needs to be filled. And yeah, so, so I'm rather not so much interested in the individual processes, but more or less in the overall platform structures. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting, yeah. Sena? Yeah. Oh, go ahead, well, Matthias, please. And then Sena. Um, I'm kind of, let's say, a little bit along the lines uh, of Achim. I'm, I'm very interested, actually, to see how, also with new material systems, new computational robotic systems in the loop of design and making, how actually really architecture transforms. Because what we've seen till now is also a little bit caught, I think, still in prevailing, you know, design and f f ideas about function of architecture. Um, and of course, I'm including our work. And I think we, if we see uh, about where uh, the challenges are, the question is, well, how, how will architecture actually and the design of architecture and the typologies of architecture develop with these new sensibilities? What will um, future occupants actually want from architecture? Is there something which is actually shifting even on a larger ground yeah. uh, than we're discussing, but which is based on this transformation towards a process and uh, oriented and very integrative uh, thinking about design at the same time is also uh, very culturally oriented is also very creative uh, and exploratory maybe yeah. something actually I'm, I'm looking really for also a little bit for a new architecture honestly mm -hmm. uh, if I may say that um, and and it's it's a bit hard to grasp within that I, sometimes I think it's here I see it coming but on the other hand I also think well pretty quickly we could fall into basically just automation and replication, mm -hmm. um, either in, in boxy or, or blobby terms, right? Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing, uh, just one point I would like to mention, I think it's also going back to relatively archaic mm. uh, systems, to simplicity. That's something where I kind of have a hope, maybe also, I mean, if you're bringing AI and machine learning, etc., to somehow fuse, you know, the kind of, let's say, high tech and uh, the, the, the very the very simple approaches mm. uh, and figure out really new concepts of looking at the world and, and building the world uh, of the future. Mm. Yeah. yeah, next. Oh, that's not too philosophical. Uh, I think uh, another change which is kind of required is um, a change in the culture of practice of, practice of uh, design or architecture because we see that we, uh, we need to work uh, uh, with an interdisciplinary approach. Yeah. And uh, by definition, architects are generalists, but they, they need to also be able to grasp this culture of uh, working in a multidisciplinary environment. Yeah. So, and, and on the other hand, so we cannot become completely a specialist because actually an interdisciplinary approach uh, and need a, a kind of a 
general knowledge about other disciplines. So I think uh, it's a kind of also a, a, a pedagogical challenge hmm. uh, in academic environments to, to, to find a way to, to train the architects of the future and designers of the future. Yeah, okay. that's a good point. Go ahead. So like one thing I would like to, so Mateus, following up on your, on your comment, um, um, like there's, and also Sina, like uh, on what the profession is going to, like how do you begin to like materialize this into something that becomes, like that people can read as architecture, right? And I think it's really important, I think everyone here agrees on like, on, we're all here because we're working with these tools, right? Um, but at the same time, there's kind of the counter movement of, against all of this at the same time. And the question is, is like, how do you not have this like fall away, Mateus? Like you were saying, like it could very easily just uh, like the, the 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 things that we're developing could be washed over. Um, and like we're we're pushing we're pushing for change, but at the same time, the counter movement is like fighting change with the same, but in a much more sort of colorful way. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so the thing is, just like how like how do we uh, like how do we move this? Uh, not that everything should be this, like I don't think we're, anybody's implying that, but at the same time, like how do we convince people, uh, students, uh, other, other academics, that what we're doing is mean, like, meaningful towards reshaping the future, like, like solving those problems, right? Like, and, and how can it also not feel cold? Like how can it feel uh, like beautiful and redefine a new typology of, of architectural building? Um, that's kind of a really big sort of thing, but that's, Anybody want to try to take a bite off that? I know, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just like, it's open, please. You look the, no, the no, most terrified. No, maybe just quick. I, I mean, basically, I think I'm quite Darwinian in that sense. I mean, what I've seen happening in these last uh, 13 years since we started the research here at ETH, and uh, I mean, you guys have been around, etc. that this has, it was so tremendous. I think this is just happening, and either it's happening or, or it's going to die. I, Honestly, I don't care so much. Interesting is that it's happening. I mean, mm -hmm. you guys are here. You're interested. You're thinking about how to change these ways that we design and build. And I think we just need to have confidence in that. We need to show that. We need to demonstrate that. We need to build buildings, pavilions, uh, start spin-offs, etc. I mean, it is just about uh, a critical but uh, deliberate activity. Mm -hmm. And that will that will eventually win obviously there is a lot of powers against this but i mean if you spend your time thinking about that i don't know so <laughs> yeah okay you were going to say something yeah i think uh, i think what what i think is important is that we reached a level where we have and I think that's why something like this is fantastic, is that we have a bit more differentiated discourse. I think there's still sort of those very broad notions like digital design, robotic fabrication, and um, I think these things have become actually relatively specific, uh, sort of, or ventured in different di directions. So I think that's the first thing that we need to establish, not for us, but for a better general understanding mm -hmm. um, of what we're actually trying to do and what we try to contribute. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that is uh, uh, important. Um, on the other hand, I think we should also be a bit more critical with ourselves mm -hmm. and actually look into the history of our own field. I mean, serial um, system, sort of serial uh, industrial production architecture had, had, has happened yeah. pretty much, especially in the country where I've come from, uh, especially its eastern part, and we should learn our lessons from how to not do these things. Yeah? Um, and I think sometimes there's a bit of kind of blindfolded enthusiasm that we can just yeah. do that sort of in a second iteration and it will turn out better. I'm not entirely <laughs> sure. It might be more, more effective, but... Um, so I think that level of criticality is something that I think we also need to establish mm. um, that we don't lose touch to yeah. the other part of the community, which we somehow, of course, need to yeah. be connected with. No? Well, uh, a counter question to this is, uh, Kendra, you have, you know, you started out in architecture and you've taken that knowledge and skill set and uh, made it very meaningful to vast number of areas outside of architecture, so to speak. What has been your experience? What do you see? In other words, we are not just taking passively knowledge from, you know, if you will, robotics uh, research elsewhere and applying it here, but actually producing something of value 
to the world across, all disciplines. What, is, what would you say from your experience? Well, I think I was always looking for people who knew a lot about different things than I did. Mm. Um, being really kind of open-minded to what they bring to the table and valuing the sort of expertise that they, that they have. I think I look at you know the the early work of Batandale with gravity. I mean, we I didn't have an understanding really of of what an onset workflow mm. was like naturally. Um, but I worked with some people who were you know had been in that area for a really long time and had done some incredible things and were very well versed in the tools of visual effects and cinematography. And so I think through being very open to having a, a conversation about how can we bring these two worlds together was the way that we kind of came up with some ideas that I think were really unique at the time. Mm -hmm. In a way, it is a, a, a broader connected ecosystem of uh, people from different areas working together, which is the collaborative network that Sigrid, we've been talking about, right? I mean, that you have uh, seen this emerge, as you noted the, uh, yesterday, actually. You're shown the map and how it has exploded over just three to four years, right? What is your perspective on that in terms of collaboration, particularly that now we can only make things happen in these networks and co through collaboration, not through individuals uh, working as lone wolves? Yeah, I think um, what is... I mean... It, do you think now we, we ha like if if we think about robotics again? Okay, I don't I don't like the term very much, but even though if we think about robotics, we now have an output device that can be at any place on the world, and the designers can be at another place of the world. Yeah, so yeah. that means that we can distribute the knowledge and we can distribute the design, and we can actually share platforms. And I think the idea of sharing such platforms is, is a good idea also in terms of the future construction because yeah, why do you have to, tra tra uh, uh, to produce something at one special point and then transport it? Yeah? Why can't you have distributed production sites, for instance, and you just send the files where, wherever you are? At the mm -hmm. moment, everything is very local. And I, th I truly believe that uh, the business models and also the, the, maybe the way we work to together in terms of collaboration will change. That for instance, if you as an architect get a big project at another point of the world, you just collaborate more and you just find, so, uh, the, um, apart from the human resource, but also the production resource yeah. and everything, uh, in a more, like in an easier way, that you do not have to, for instance, travel there, get to know the people, then find a partner office or whatever. So I think that there will, there will probably platforms emerge where we have, where you will have this collective sharing, the, yeah. collect, the collective sharing of work, where you can specify processes that people then can uh, provide this collective knowledge or the specific knowledge to share. Yeah? Yeah. Like very similar to, for instance, Kickstarter, where you just share money to make something happen. So probably in our terms, it will be more that we share either technology or that we share also our brain or human resources to make a bigger project or another project or something that we believe in happen. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot will be very disruptive. I don't yeah. think that architects will be single architects as we see now, because a lot of, like there are only a few really big offices, and most of the times people try to do all their workload by themselves uh, as single architects. Um, and especially also when you, th you, you show it, like when you look at the Austrian Chamber of Architects, I think architects are really the poorest people in the world <laughs> um, because I think the average uh, what they earn is about 
I don't know, 20,000 euros a year or something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. So I just think that we have to become more collective also yeah. in the way of thinking. And I think that architects are team workers and that we, we, we think in, 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 in distributed processes all the time. So why don't we start by ourselves to think different? So that's why I said, how is technology going to change the way we want to work as architects? Great, great. Thank you. And uh, uh, I wanted to just give a heads up that if there are questions from the audience, we will come to you in just one moment as you think about and be ready. Uh, I wanted to just ask the, uh, pose a question to the panel and then go to the floor uh, for, uh, uh, for questions as well. So uh, what's, um, uh, what, is, what has been the most exciting collaboration you have had outside of uh, the discipline? that where you said, oh my God, I just benefited, I have been inspired, and I couldn't have done without it. Uh, what, what is, like, one example of that? Jonas Buchli. <laughs> <laughs> just one example. No, we had really great, great collaborations with many people, yeah. which we appreciate a lot. Just one practical example, because you've all seen him. You see how open he is. You see how he shared viewpoints on architecture with yeah. us, which came out of a lot of discussions about architecture, about robotics, etc. So you kind of start to dive in, although you come from completely different backgrounds, have different languages, etc. You start to dive into actually one question which you tackle together. I mean, very much like you described your collaboration on the, on the, on the film sets, etc. I mean, that's a, that's a very high quality. And that's, in the end, let's be honest, that's a human quality. That's not mm. a... Yeah. a yeah, you, you cannot probably prescribe this uh, to happen, but there are environments uh, which you can create where the chances that people meet yeah. and exchange, that these chances are, are kind of heightened uh, and, you, and, uh, and improved. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. It's uh, difficult to single out one because we always work uh, in collaborations. Yeah. I cannot think of one project that we did just by ourselves. Um, and I think that, on the one hand, is important, but I think there's also, uh, it's interesting that I think a collaboration is really successful when it's also clear what we bring into the collaboration, because that's sometimes yeah. the most ambiguous in that round of, let's say, mm. uh, uh, expertise. Mm. And um, I think that's, that's something that we should also be very much aware of, more what are kind of, I think truly interdisciplinary work works only if you have a disciplinary competence that you can bring into the game. Um, and you allow the other disciplines also to have their insights. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I think the collaboration is not really the, the, the new thing. Also for any practicing architect, they always yeah. collaborate. No, they have to. I think it's the mode of collaboration that makes the difference. Um, right. And I think that, uh, I, I totally agree, is something that happens on a personal level, but I think it's also uh, a question of how do you meet these people on eye level yeah. and not as service consultants. Yeah, Yeah, but I think it's also a, a thing of lost in translation. Yeah? So we very often talk about the same thing and we just use different terms. So I think we also have to uh, exceed beyond the language we have been using right now. I think we just have to also define methods, but also language of how we can actually mm. communicate and collaborate with others. Right. Yeah, sometimes when you talk about robots yeah. uh, and you talk with uh, mechanical engineers and with other people, then yeah, it's very difficult to understand each other. That's the experience that I make all the time. Yeah. So I think if, if we find a way of c communication and very of, often also this data transformation is the way of communication because that's very clear yeah. and it's not, it, it's, it, that's the antithesis to it's very personal uh, because then you can also structure maybe also the way we communicate with between people and people, but also be, between people and machines. So, yeah. Um, yes. Please. 
maybe just along these lines, I think we had a very successful experiment in the DFAB house, which you can uh, visit tonight, uh, where actually different teams were working on different parts of this structure. And there actually, one part of the negotiation was exactly this data interface. And, you know, you can make the technology, you know, a discussion enabler, etc. Still, the chemistry yeah. needs to work, right? And then you figure out, for example, really the data interface between, you know, this mesh mode wall and the smart slab. Yeah. Uh, and that really becomes part of the process and mm. then makes the entire process completely fluid. Yeah. But you need to invest in this partnership and in this uh, joint, let's say, framing of, um, I don't like the term problem so much, when, uh, of the opportunity. Yeah. Mm. Maybe, maybe one thing that I, I would like to add is that it also takes a lot of time. So I yeah. think it's, to establish that community, communication takes years to become operative. I mean, we work with, I mean, to really understand what the bio, we work a lot with people from natural science, biologists, to really understand what they were actually talking about, not in terms of the vocabulary, but the concepts behind that. Yeah. I mean, it took us sort of a couple of years to building an ontology together yeah. so that we can make sure that this is somehow understandable on all sides. I think that's also something that we need to allow for, especially if we talk about disciplines that are a bit further away from our kind yeah. of core discipline. Well said. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting insight, that uh, communication in the language become very important, the practices become very important, our assumptions are challenged constantly. Uh, that's a very exciting and, as you initially put, a very uncomfortable situation, uh, and that discomfort is very important in uh, being able to collaborate. Uh, that's a great point. So we will uh, invite questions from the audience. Sure. So, oh, I'm sorry, I, I apologize. Go ahead, please, sis. Uh, I didn't no see that. Um, I just wanted to add, I think something that's been really helpful in a lot of the collaborations that I've seen is when both parties find what you're doing to be really useful and yeah. understand why the other party sees value in it and understanding their motivations um, to yeah. facilitate. Good point. Yeah. Question. Back there. Um, actually, project and we'll repeat the question. That's probably the easiest. Oh, we have a, uh, yeah, actually, why not? Let's use it, of course. Oh, God. There we go. Okay, we have the first catch. This, this is working? Yeah. So people on this panel and, and everyone who's been uh, you know, presenting in the past couple of days, uh, you've been using these systems to their extreme capacity, probably beyond what the engineers designing the systems thought they're capable of you know, doing. Um, um, yes, but not at least in an inventive way. Um, and, and you found it very enabling. Um, and to allude to, to what's been said in the, by the first keynote, uh, Chris from Arup, um, you know, it's what's annoying is going to be innovated, innovated on. Um, so my question to you is what do you wish, how these systems, what, what would be, uh, uh, what, what do you find annoying about these systems right now? What's stopping you and what's not enabling you like, enough? Uh, and what would enable you, uh, sorry, um, what, what would you want these systems to do differently so that you would be enabled today and not in 30 years? <laughs> that question truly really stumped us, right? I think the question of uh, enablers and uh, barriers, uh, what, what would empower us and enable us to do things that we are not currently able to do at this very moment, uh, what do you wish uh, you had in order to do things that uh, you want to do? Would that be a fair rephrasing? I try to, un to answer the question, even though I might not have understood it. So you are asking what stops us or what do we need to be enabled to do things that we can't do at the moment, right? Yeah, you already are using these systems. Okay. Um, I think very often um, we ourselves are the problem that we can't imagine what we might be able to do with the technology that we are just starting to engage in. So I think what I would like more is that we define first what we actually want to do and how, how we want to work and then we look for the right technology and the right devices that enable us and if we can't find these devices, we just have to invent them. 
Um, I think architects have always been in innovators and inventors. I think we should go away from being users. We should rather invent and have our own visions what we actually or how, how we see the future of architecture, the future of building, the future of creating, the future of producing, the future of driving machines, the future of using technology, like of, of driving or, or getting technology to do what we want them to do. So I think it, we have to enhance our imagination in a lot of things. Well said. Other views? I think, uh, uh, if I understand your question, you're asking why, why, why not now and why always we are talking about future. I think, uh, to many extent, this depends on uh, the the platform that we are working in. For instance, if I, for instance, compare, I compare uh, the the working culture in uh, ETH and TU Delft. There are a lot of supports probably from the state in uh, ETH, uh, while uh, in the uh, Netherlands we see actually uh, many supports uh, for startups and those startups uh, kind of uh, connect uh, uh, the academia and practice and to some extent uh, um, kind of uh, we have to uh, gain uh, or regain uh, back the, the construction site and don't only leave it uh, to the hands of contractors. So I think uh, uh, this startup culture mm. uh, is a kind of a bridge between uh, what is happening here, uh, which is a part of the future, and what what can happen now Very uh, in uh, in uh, in real world. And I think Kendra is actually doing uh, one of those ventures. Right, you are entering a new realm and uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, right, I mean, would would you say I mean, what you are trying to enable? In fact, right through software uh, systems, or what? What's your vision of that, Kendra? Uh, something really pragmatic that I see as being a challenge today is getting things to talk to each other. Yeah. Getting machines to talk to each other, getting humans to talk to machines, communication, connectivity. Um, I think those two things are something that you kind of need to have as a yeah. foundation before you can start to make things more accessible, before you can start to make them more intelligent, more usable, more effective, more collaborative. Yeah. Um, and so I see that as kind of an opportunity to try to, to try to build something that, you know, maybe it may be early, it may be just in time. I'm yeah. not sure. Great, great. Uh, I would like to be respectful of time and we promise we'll stay within. So we are on the clock. Uh, shall we go for one more question or, okay, one more question and then we can uh, conclude this. So, back burning there. question back there. Oh, there's one in the, there was one in the back and then there's... I'm sorry. Whoever throws the, the orange block, <laughs> if, you, if you get it, you talk. I'm not going to manage that. Okay. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so you said here yeah, you're, everyone is doing a research on the collaboration between um, architects and robots, but it is for the future for the whole community. So I wanted to ask, how do you see the collaboration, not only between architects and robots, but also how do you see the community inside this procedure? Because we saw two examples that, um, before we saw from uh, Giovanni Berry that he tried to bring the community into this procedure. So people without really um, a lot of knowledge and without um, um, technological equipment, they had the chance to be part of it. So how do you see all this um, technology? How can it be? Um, oh yeah. Right. So how can it be used from everyday people in order to make a change in the future? Mm. Like a real future in architecture, how can it, yeah, that's it. I mean, the, this question has a, has a broad set of, of answers, but maybe just to drill a bit uh, on one point. I think, uh, first of all, we need to distinguish a bit between 
let's say, still, still there is a temporality in architecture. There is something like a conception, design, and build phase, and we're not yet fully there and probably never will shrink this to just one moment. But there might be, as for example, you know, uh, mentioned with the concept of, you know, more thinking about delays uh, in the time, etc. There might be transfers over these timescales, but there is still a timescale. And if I suppose there will be some, still something um, which I hold very dearly, namely craftsmen and craftsmanship in this digital area, uh, then I think you're, for example, talking of the craftsman as, as, as a possible, uh, let's say, enabled person. The critical question for me there is, is this craftsman actually uh, learning something actually is he um, is he experiencing something and doing something which is uh, let's say interesting for him and his life and 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 enabling him to do something or is it is he just basically turned and I frame this a bit provocatively into a robot by the technology because you could also look at it uh, that way so at, at the moment where I execute something which is delivered from me from a headquarter to my headset and I execute it, it doesn't mean that me as a human, I'm empowered. Potentially, I'm just being turned into the, let's say, I'm just the cheapest robot available uh, because I have all the dexterity. So I think this is, it's, uh, what I want to say with this, this is a large ethical question. It's really not easy to be answered. Uh, the hope would be that, uh, that actually, for example, I could learn something um, with these technologies which would actually enrich my experience and my contribution to the world. This would, for example, be a very positive framing of this direct uh, relation. Sorry, I just digged into one aspect which I find always a bit critical. Yes, you can be enabled and augmented, and of course technology makes everything beautiful, but you could as well be basically enslaved. Like we have, for example, it's the same experience as with the mobile phone, right? We're all super enabled, and suddenly we find ourselves addicted, right? So. Any other views on that from the panelists? Okay, <laughs> you did a good job. Okay, great. Well, I think that is all the time we have. I'm pretty sure. First, uh, let me thank all the panelists for uh, being good sport, uh, for the spontaneous discussion that we've been able to have, for the contributions you have made to the field and to the book uh, as well. And so uh, thank you all, and, uh, and we'll take the conversation uh, into the hallways uh, from here. So let's give a round of applause to our panelists.